in Brazil's capital, Brasilia, and have no idea when they'll return to the forest. Even in the big city, they don't feel safe. The people who are against us belong to organized groups. They are rich criminals who have the money to go wherever they like. The emotional toll of living at constant risk is huge, says Agio Lobo. He says he avoids public places and has stopped hanging out with friends. You're aware that you could be killed at any moment, he says. You don't know who to trust. Lobos considered giving up his campaign to protect the forest on which his community depends. He's decided to carry on because he says in his heart he knows he's doing the right thing. Philip Reeves, NPR News, the Amazon Rainforest. No foreign language film has ever opened at the numbers of a new satirical comedy that opened this past weekend. A Korean film called Parasite opened to record audiences in New York and L.A. and expands to other cities Friday. Critic Bob Landello says no matter what audiences expect, they're likely to be surprised. A tale of two families, the Parks, who live in a designer house atop a hill, and the Kims, who live in a grungy basement apartment across town. Literally high and low, both physically and in social status, they wouldn't normally meet. But then a friend drops by the Kims' basement with a gift, a big stone that his grandfather claims will bring the family material wealth. This is so metaphorical, says 20-something Kim Ki-woo. His mom is skeptical. Food would have been better, she says. Still, the friend also brings word that the wealthy Park family needs an English tutor for their daughter, and he sets up Ki Wu with an audition for the job. Mrs. Park tells him she always sits in on the first lesson. Is it okay with you? Ki Wu gets the tutoring job, then starts building on what is a really good deal. The Parks pay well, so he introduces his sister, he says she's a friend of a classmate, as an art therapist for their son. Beats folding pizza boxes to earn money or leaving the window open in the Kim apartment when the city fumigates the alley it's on to get free exterminating. Money is an iron, says someone. It smooths out the wrinkles. Another metaphor and a clue that the Kim family's scam, which just seems funny at first, is more than it appears. Writer-director Bong Joon-ho never goes for just funny. His sci-fi epic Snowpiercer, for instance, put the last survivors of a climate disaster on a train and set them to killing each other in a class war. And as the comedy starts curdling in Parasite, class struggle is again on his mind. I'm dead serious. The haves here aren't hateful, they're just insensitive. Mr. Park keeps crunching up his nose and talking about the stench of poverty. And the have-nots aren't vicious so much as hapless for a while. And then, well, shouldn't spoil things. Let's just say that by Parasite's conclusion, what started out as a comedy of manners has become a furious snarl of rage and his most arresting social satire yet. I'm Bob Mandela. This is NPR News. The Trump administration has blocked the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau from trying to fix a troubled student loan forgiveness program. The program was designed to help public service workers like firefighters, but thousands of people say they were unfairly rejected. There are hundreds of thousands of people who are counting on the government to get this right. Plus, a new memoir from Julie Andrews on the next Morning Edition. We invite you to join us tomorrow for Morning Edition here on KUNC. Listen with us until 9. Just ask your smart speaker to play KUNC. I'm Desmond O'Boyle. All Things Considered is supported by UNC School of Theater, Arts, and Dance, presenting The Cherry Orchard, a dramatic comedy about the balance between old money and the new world. Starting October 17th at the Laneworthy Theater, tickets at arts.unco.edu slash events. This is Colorado Edition from KUNC. Last week, the Catholic Church announced a settlement fund for victims of clergy sexual abuse. We do know in other states, victims have received anywhere from you know, maybe $10,000 to half a million dollars in some cases. On today's show, we'll learn more about that fund and what else the church has done to prevent abuse. Plus, we explore the cultural impact of the Balloon Boy hoax 10 years later. That's coming up. 
Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Louise Schiavone. Fort Worth, Texas police officer Aaron Dean has been arrested and charged with the murder of Atatiana Jefferson. She's the 28-year-old woman who was shot when officers responded to a report of an open door. The young woman had been playing video games with her nephew. Authorities say there's no sign that officers knocked on the front door before the shooting began. The U.N. estimates at least 160,000 civilians in northeastern Syria have been displaced since the start of a Turkish offensive last week. The operation targeting Syrian Kurds, longstanding U.S. allies, followed the Trump administration's withdrawal of troops from an enclave in the region. Jerry Buskarin reports that Turkish President Erdogan is fighting to control a strategic town in the region. Erdogan's plan, he says, is to rid the area of terrorists and settle Arabs in Monbij. The city is in a largely Kurdish part of northern Syria, near the Euphrates River. About a 1,000 U.S. troops previously stationed in the area were ordered to begin a final withdrawal last night. Meanwhile, Kurdish militias say they have stuck a deal with the Assad regime, which is sending government troops to the border. Jerry Buskarin reporting. Vice President Pence says President Trump has asked him to lead a delegation to Turkey and says he plans to leave as quickly as possible. He says the Trump administration is imposing new sanctions on Turkey and they'll continue and worsen until Turkey agrees to cease fire in northeastern Syria. In New Orleans, at the construction site of the Hard Rock Hotel, the effort continues to locate a worker missing since the weekend's partial collapse of the structure. New Orleans Mayor Latoya Cantrell. This continues to be a rescue mission at this time. Two people died. More than 20 were injured in the collapse. Rescue workers and search dogs are scouring the site. The Dow closed down today, 29 points. This is NPR News. Support for NPR comes from this station and from the financial services firm of Raymond James, offering personalized wealth management advice and banking and capital markets expertise, along with a legacy of putting clients' financial well-being first. Learn more at RaymondJames.com. And from MindBody, where wellness and people meet with thousands of fitness classes to find and book in one place. Studios can join the network at mindbodyonline.com. It's Monday, October 14th. You're listening to KUNC's Colorado Edition, your daily look at news from around the state. I'm Erin O'Toole. And I'm Henry Zimmerman. Ballots for Colorado's 2019 election are being sent out in the mail. On today's show, we're going to bring you reporting on the two statewide questions that are up for a vote this year. Both were referred by state lawmakers. We begin with Proposition CC. As KUNC Scott Franz reports, the measure is pitting lawmakers who say they need more money for roads and education against residents who think government spending should be limited. At the heart of Prop CC is the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, or Tabor Amendment passed by voters in 1992, it limits spending by capping the amount of tax dollars the state can keep each year. Anything above that gets refunded to taxpayers. Let's remove that cap. Let's remove it permanently. That's Democratic House Speaker Casey Becker. She's one of the top supporters of CC. Our constituents are saying they want to see more investments in transportation. They want to see more investments in K-12 especially. So Why not just ask them if we can keep the revenue we're already um, collecting from them? If approved, the state would get to keep and spend an estimated $300 million during the next fiscal year. The money would be split evenly among K-12 through and higher education and transportation. It's not pleasant to drive around here anymore. Republican Senator Kevin Priola also hopes voters will see the value in letting the state keep the money. Understanding the hole we've dug in transportation funding the prior two, three decades, uh, depending on how you slice it, we're looking at a $7 billion structural deficit with projects. But even with Tabor, taxpayers have only gotten refunds nine times since it was enacted. So Prop CC isn't seen as a stable source of funding. It can't go to teacher pay. It's not for reoccurring expenses. Michael Fields leads a nonprofit focusing on conservative issues and is a critic of Proposition CC. You won't see more teachers, so class sizes will go down or anything like that. He thinks if CC is successful, lawmakers will be back to remove the rest of Tabor, including the part that stops the government from raising taxes without voter approval. He also questions the state's track record of spending the money it already has. 
Taper has done good for us. We're number one economy in the country. Uh, why don't we stick with this instead of making these drastic changes uh, that I think starts with Prop CC? So I would tell voters, you know what, uh, this is not a good plan. The Denver Post even said uh, to that it was fatally flawed. But more than 90 organizations are in favor of Prop CC, including the Colorado Association of Transit Agencies, or CASTA. What everybody has acknowledged that Proposition CC is not the solution. And Rajeski is executive director of the organization that represents more than 50 transit and bus agencies. We're all hoping it's part of the puzzle of getting some more funding into transit. Now, because CC isn't um, funding that you know you're going to get every year, it probably isn't um, the most appropriate funding source for operating funds, which is frankly what most of our agencies are most desperate for at this point, but what it can do is help with buying new buses or building a bus barn that allows your buses to last longer. As November 5th gets closer, the debate over Prop CC is ramping up. Speaker Casey Becker and Michael Fields recently squared off in a debate hosted by the Colorado Springs Gazette and Colorado Politics. Here they are making their closing arguments for and against CC. Why are we not making the investments with general fund revenue that we should be making? It's because we have an artificial cap that no other state in the entire country has. No one does this. We, if we want to have a top-notch state, we need to be making the investments in our infrastructure. We are the number two state in the whole country for how much our budget general fund has grown since the recession. We're number two. With these ideas of cuts or that we don't have enough money, we are growing faster as a general fund, even under Tabor, than these other states. And so I think we have to have an honest discussion about why isn't money getting towards roads more. If Proposition CC is not approved, economists are predicting a Tabor refund next year of between $26 and $79 for taxpayers. I'm Scott Franz at the State Capitol. And now a look at that second ballot measure. Ever since the Colorado Water Plan passed in 2015, state leaders have pointed to its goals of more efficient water use and increased storage as something to aspire to. But they never had a solid way to pay for the projects and conservation programs it outlined. Colorado lawmakers are hoping that will change with a statewide ballot question they referred to voters this November. KUNC's Luke Runyon starts his look at Proposition DD at a tailgate party in Denver. Music is blaring, grills are firing up, and this parking lot outside Mile High Stadium in Denver is awash in navy blue and orange. Todd Endicott of Lafayette is standing outside an ambulance turned Broncos fan mobile. He outfitted this orange and blue rig for tailgates. I'm here on a windy Sunday to talk to fans about Proposition DD. The question on this year's ballot is asking Colorado voters whether or not they want legalized sports betting in the state. Okay. You guys, yeah. yeah, let's chat. Want to do a shot right. and then, then we can do it? <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Endicott's been a Broncos fan for decades. Decades and says he'll use a local bookie to bet on games. During the football season, he puts a couple thousand dollars down on a whole slew of matchups and hopefully ends up with a net gain of a hundred bucks in the end. It's all about the adrenaline during the game of knowing I'm either going to win or lose. So, Do you ever bet against the Broncos? Hell no. No, you don't bet against the Broncos. That's like, you know, saying God doesn't exist. So. <laughs> But come November, Colorado voters will decide if sports fans like Endicott can take their wagers above board, tax the proceeds, and spend that new revenue on a long list of water projects in the state. Everything from expanded reservoirs to urban conservation to agricultural efficiency. A few miles upstream of the stadium, Alec Garnett stands along the banks of the South Platte River in a newly created park. I call this the potluck of all fisheries because you can catch trout and carp and uh, bass and walleye and it pretty much has everything right here. Garnett is the Colorado House Majority Leader. The Denver Democrat sponsored the bill that put Prop DD on the ballot. Here's how it would work. 
The measure would allow existing casinos in the state to start taking bets on all kinds of sports, and their profits would be taxed at 10%. In the last few election cycles, Colorado voters haven't had much of an appetite for big new tax increases to fund transportation or education. And so Garnett's hoping voters see Prop DD as similar to the legalization of recreational marijuana taking a narrow, currently illegal practice and taxing it for public benefit. Water is an issue that brings Democrats together and Republicans together. It brings farmers together with the conservation community. The proposition supports water projects. But not everyone in the legalization of recreational marijuana, taking a narrow, currently illegal practice and taxing it for public benefit. Water is an issue that brings Democrats together and Republicans together. It brings farmers together with the conservation community. The proposition supports water projects. But not everyone in the environmental community is on board with DD. Fort Collins-based activist Gary Walkner created a small committee to rally against the ballot measure called Coloradans for Climate Justice. And the projects are completely undefined and not specified. And so this is really kind of a blank check. Walkner says he opposes any use of public tax dollars to pay for new dams or expanded ones. And even though this would just be on... The gamblers at the beginning, it sets a terrible precedent that climate damage uh, should be paid for by the public. The U.S. Supreme Court gave states the green light to legalize sports gambling in the spring of 2018. Since then, a dozen have chosen to do so. Though in some of those states, revenues have come in well below their initial projections. Colorado expects to take in about $16 million each year for the first few years. Back at the Broncos' tailgate, Commerce City School Administrator Chris Duran says he already bets on sports during multiple trips to Las Vegas each year. We got casinos. Why not bring sports betting? Attach it to it. We already got. We're already halfway there. Let's finish the game. With so much media attention focused on the election next year, Duran says he didn't even know about the one happening next month. Same with the 10 other Broncos fans I interviewed at the game. Meaning the measure's biggest hurdle might just be a lack of knowledge it even exists. I work in education. I would love for the money to go to education. But I also see, you know, from a, from an economic and an ecosystem standpoint, absolutely. I would support it 100%. I think it's a great investment. And, you know, hey, water's living. And water is, is survival. So we need it. Ballots are being sent out to voters now and need to be returned by November 5th. I'm Luke Runyon in Denver. Now let's take a look at today's headlines. Teachers at a central Colorado school district have gone on strike over a contract dispute, leading Park County School District RE2 to cancel classes today. Teachers are asking for better pay and a contract that includes them more in decision making. District officials have offered a $2,000 raise. The district southwest of Denver consists of three schools with about 40 teachers and 600 students. This is the third teacher strike in Colorado in the last 18 months. A recall vote in Nederland is on hold after seven protest petitions were filed last week. The initial recall petition for the mayor, mayor pro tem, and a town trustee gathered enough signatures by the end of September for a vote. Residents then had a week to file a written protest against the petition. The city will hold a protest hearing October 24th. You're listening to Colorado Edition from KUNC. It's our fall membership drive here at the radio station, and we're here to remind you that Colorado Edition brings you what you need to know, the latest on politics, business, arts, and education from around our state. And it's made possible by listeners like you becoming members. In today's complex media environment, you count on KUNC to bring you stories that are balanced, accurate, and enlightening. Each weeknight, you get hours of live, up-to-the-moment news on all things considered in Marketplace and the local news that you need from Colorado Edition. We go beyond the headlines to keep you informed on what's happening around the world, around the country, and right here in Colorado. So if you value KUNC, become a sustaining member right now for $12 a month, $20 a month, $25 a month, whatever works for your budget. It's really easy. Just go to our website, KUNC.org, and thank you.
Welcome back. I'm Erin O'Toole. And I'm Henry Zimmerman. Last week, a new settlement fund was announced for victims of sexual abuse by Colorado priests. This comes as there is an ongoing independent investigation into the extent of abuse by priests in our state. Here to tell us more about the fund and what the church has been doing to prevent sexual abuse of children over the past decade is Jennifer Brown from the Colorado Sun. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, Erin. Thanks for having me. Now, there is an ongoing independent investigation to determine the extent of abuse of children by priests, and this is going as far back as 1950. What will be in that report, and when is that expected out? The report is expected out as soon as the end of October, so the church is kind of waiting for it to drop. What that report is is an independent review by an investigator who's not with the church or with the state attorney general's office, but someone who has been looking through the files, looking through any of the reports that the church has received since 1950, and will put this all in a document to show, you know, how many people have been abused, for one, and what the church has done about it. The review also includes looking at the church policies to see if they have put regulations in place to protect people. Last week, this settlement fund was announced for victims of clergy sexual abuse. Can you just get us up to speed a little bit? Tell us more about how this fund will work. Well, the fund will be run by two experienced victim fund people who nationwide have worked on other funds for the Catholic Church. And basically how it will work is people will fill out the proper paperwork describing what had happened to them. The team will review it, determine, I guess, how credible it is and how egregious it is. And there will be some undetermined amount of money that people will receive. And the money will come from the diocese in Colorado, which are in Denver, Colorado Springs, and Pueblo. And they have vowed that that will not come from any money that parishioners have donated, you know, to their parish or to a school. It will come from funds specifically raised or brought about for this particular settlement fund. There's no limit on it, how much they'll spend. We do know in other states, victims have received anywhere from you know, maybe $10,000 to half a million dollars in some cases. So we won't know that for a while. Okay. And so what has the church been doing to prevent this type of abuse? So a few things. One, they teach a two-hour course, a safety training that's all about how to recognize sexual abuse in children and prevent it from happening. And every single employee of the church or any Catholic school or anyone who wants to volunteer, whether they're Catholic or not, must take this two-hour course. So I went to that. It's hard to listen to. There's a video about, you know, with actors playing out roles of being the abusers and the children who have been abused. And it is difficult to watch, but there's a lot of important information in it. And that's something that, you know, public school doesn't require of volunteers. So that is a more stringent requirement. Another interesting thing that they've been doing for years are psych evaluations of anybody who wants to be a priest. So they have a recruiter who is a priest who will go to mass generally near college campuses, you know, Boulder, Greeley, and meet young men who might be considering the priesthood. And once this priest knows them for about six months and believes that they're, you know, possibly fit to go to seminary and be a priest, they start to go through this battery of tests, really, and and one of them is this deep psychological evaluation done by a psychologist, which weeds out about one-third of applicants. Right. Have Catholic churches in Colorado seen fewer people applying to become priests since these allegations first surface against the church? Yeah, I asked that question, too, and I got kind of conflicting answers. The priest, Father O'Neill, who is a recruiter, he thought that there were a couple years after the big report in Philadelphia that, you know, talks about 300 uh, priests who had abused children over the decades. He felt that he saw um, a decline in the number of young men in Colorado who were seeking the priesthood. Another man I interviewed who is psychologist Jim Langley, he does the psych evaluations for these men who want to be priests. And he said that, you know, he's only been doing this for a few years, but the numbers have stayed steady and that the young men looking to become priests 
nowadays have grown up in this scandal and they've already digested it, so to speak. All right. Jennifer Brown is a writer for the Colorado Sun. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Erin. Tomorrow marks the 10-year anniversary of a media event that captivated audiences around the world. And it happened right here in northern Colorado. At the center of it all, one Fort Collins family and their silver helium-filled balloon. After launching the weather balloon into the sky on October 15th, 2009, Richard and Mayumi Heaney weren't able to track down their six-year-old son, Falcon. The concern at the time was that he had climbed into the balloon before it departed. Authorities were quickly called, including the Federal Aviation Administration, and before long, folks around the country and around the world watched to see what would happen with the balloon as it floated south from Fort Collins toward the Denver International Airport possibly carrying a small boy with it. Now, the balloon ultimately came down about 12 miles from DIA, and when authorities went to investigate, the boy was nowhere to be found. As it turned out, Falcon was hiding in the attic above the family's garage, putting to bed any concerns that he went along for the ride. But then the family went on CNN to talk about the incident, and that's where the hoax part came into play. Joining us now to talk about the impact of the Balloon Boy hoax 10 years later is Robert Sanchez, a senior staff writer for 5280 Magazine. He recently investigated the hoax, and his story, called The Balloon Boy Hoax Solved, can be found in the October issue of 5280. Robert, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Describe for us what that hysteria was like back in 2009 as people followed along with the Balloon Boy story as it unfolded live on TV. People were really freaked out about this whole thing. And I'm a parent myself and I remember watching it thinking, my goodness, you know, the six year old boy, he must be so scared. And is he going to fall out? Is it going to crash? And people were just captivated by it across the country. And it was it was just a very frightening time for people because you're watching this live and you don't want to see the death of a child at any time. But my goodness, on live television and people were just so tuned into this thing. I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me after this story and they they know exactly where they were. When this happened, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the Challenger explosion. I remember where I was with that. Some people remember where they were when, when John F. Kennedy was shot for a lot of people who were, you know, living in 2009. This is like that moment for them. Where were you when Richard Heaney's balloon went up in the air and we all thought Falcon was in it? Let's pick things up with the now infamous CNN interview, the reason we call this whole story a hoax. What happened there? Wolf Blitzer, uh, during a show, an, a CNN interview, uh, was talking to the Heenies, and Wolf Blitzer basically asked the question, did you hear your, your parents calling for you? Richard translates that to his son and says, hey, you know, he wants to know, did you hear us? And, and Falcon said, yes. And You can see a surprise in their faces, Miami and Richard's faces, and they say, what? You you heard us. Why didn't you come out? And then Falcon says, essentially, well, you told me we were doing this for the show. And Richard and Miami and the family were in the midst of trying to get a kind of science-based, wacky television show made about them. And that just started the firestorm. The The sheriff in Larimer County had initially sided with the family, and all of a sudden that threw everything into disarray. And then people were saying, oh, my goodness, this was not the truth. This was all a setup. We were all taken because this family was trying to get a reality show. Robert, do you have any thoughts 10 years later on the cultural impact of this story? Uh, in 2009, reality TV was really big, and this was on screens all across the world. Uh, after 10 years, what's the takeaway? I'm still trying to understand that. This story has been so popular at 5280, you know, just readers going through it just because they remember that kind of wackadoo time. But I think that there was like this kind of cultural resonance, especially with uh, with the reality stuff, with cable news, with with social media. You know, a lot of people think that those things divide us. But at that moment, it was like this really unifying force for people where where everybody was just worried about the safety of the six year old boy and, and, and pretty much anybody could relate to 
a family worried about, uh, you know, parents worried about a child. I certainly could. You know, I was heartbroken. I was watching with tears in my eyes, like, what is going to happen to this? And I feel that that had such a deep resonance with people who were watching at the time, which is just so many folks, that that kind of visceral feeling stuck with them. And then I think there was a really great sense of a, a letdown, a disappointment, some certainly some anger afterward when, you know, the the stuff on CNN happened and then Richard pleading guilty to it all, that people felt used. They really, really felt emotionally used and it wasn't right. And I think that that's the thing that sticks with us 10 years later, just because it was such a unifying event for our culture, our society, that people just kind of want to know what happened. Like, where are they? What are they doing? How are they moving on with their life? And then it just so happened that I was ultimately able to say definitively, yes, this this is a hoax. Robert Sanchez is the senior staff writer for 5280 Magazine. Robert, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Listen for an extended cut of this interview in tomorrow's podcast. You can read Robert's story in this month's issue of 5280 Magazine. Once again this year, Colorado students can invest in their futures for free. All 35 public colleges and universities in the state and several private institutions as well will allow students to apply without fees tomorrow. KUNC's Stephanie Daniel joins us to discuss Colorado's free application day. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Henry. So this is Colorado's second annual free application day. What do we know about the results from last year? Last year, nearly 23,000 applications were submitted that day. According to the Colorado Department of Higher Education, half of the applicants were students of color and a third were first generation. Statewide, application submissions were up 12 percent compared to 2017. Some schools actually saw an increase of more than 12 percent, one of them being University of Northern Colorado. Stephanie, I understand you spoke to the school. I did. I talked to Sean Broghammer, the interim assistant vice president for strategic enrollment. UNC received about 3,500 applications during last year's free day, and overall submissions were up 20 percent. Now, what's interesting is he said application fees aren't a huge barrier. There are fee waivers and other options for students who come from low-income families, but what free application day does is remove the fee barrier. It allows students to not only apply to a broader range of schools, but also ones they may have never considered. So I think it just opens up opportunities for students to explore additional colleges and universities they may not have considered previously. So we feel that that helps benefit UNC in terms of introducing us to a greater population of students. Colorado Free Application Day is tomorrow, and students literally have all day to submit applications from 12.01 in the morning to 11.59 at night. The state has more information on its website. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. And that's our show for today. Tomorrow on Colorado Edition, we'll bring you a look at some of the local issues that will be on the ballot next month. I'm Erin O'Toole. And I'm Henry Zimmerman. Our show is produced by Lily Tyson. Brian Larson is our executive producer. And before we go today, a reminder that Colorado Edition is made possible by listener support. In fact, many listeners are surprised to hear that 90% of the funding that pays for KUNC's programs comes from the community. That's right. And if you value KUNC and Colorado Edition, become a sustaining member today. It's easy to do. Just go online to KUNC.org. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. This is Colorado Edition from KUNC. This is KUNC 91.5 Greeley Fort Collins. KVNC 90.9 Minturn Vale. KMPB 90.7.